Big Buck Registries, Big Buck Podcast, episode number 57. Tag and Brag with David and Dean Giarizzo. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hi, this is Jackie Bushman of Buckmasters. You're listening to my favorite podcast, Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Hey, this is Corby Taylor, host of the Wild Game Hunting Podcast, and you're listening to another great episode of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. I'm Lee Lukowski. And I'm Tiffany Lukowski, and you're listening to our favorite hunting podcast on iTunes. The Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Hey guys, it's Tom Martin with Buck Commander. I'm going to make this short and sweet. If you want to hunt Kentucky, have a great time with great people, fellowship, kill deer, eat great, look up Mark Clifford. Premier Outfitters in Western Kentucky. You will not regret it. I highly recommend it. Welcome to another episode of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. This is Jay Scott, your host, and I am here with my good friend, once again, from Ohio, Dusty Phillips. Dusty, what's happening? I don't know. Here to be, 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 now. Here to make, here to be, here to be, now. Twelve, twelve and a half now. Fifteen, seventeen, even now. Now twenty, here to be, here to be, all to be, now. Here to be, twenty, here to be, twenty, here to be, twenty, here to be, twenty. Whoa. You know how to do that? Oh, you're not recording, are you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm watching a livestock sale right here on the net, man. I'm all about auctioneering. Is that like your little niche that you have, your little thing you I'm always ha- wanted to do? It is, you know. Someday, someday I'll be an auctioneer. I guarantee it. That was pretty good. Do that again. I don't know. Here to be a hundred ten dollar bit now. Here to make ten with a bit twelve and a half. Hundred twelve and a half now. Bit fifteen now. Fifteen with a bit fifteen. With a bit fifteen now. Seventeen now. Now twenty. Bit twenty. Bit twenty two and a half now. Twenty five. Would it be five? Would it be five? Would it be twenty five? Would it be? That's awesome. Not too bad. Or you just run it. You just keep looking for the next higher bid, and then you you just throw it into yeah, the, into the verbiage. Yeah, you just keep cranky, you know. And it all started out one time. I was riding in a tractor, and I bought a, a, a CD kit, like uh, how to how to auctioneer. CDs. Is that right? Yeah. It started out, uh, they, they say rubber baby buggy bumper. And I was like, what? Huh. And like when, I, when I first started, it was like rubber, ba- ba- uh, rubber baby. And then all of a sudden it was like rubber baby buggy bumper, rubber baby buggy bumper, rubber baby buggy bumper, rubber baby buggy bumper. And then next thing you know, Tommy Tadamus took two teeth, Tadamus top two tall trees. Tommy Tadamus took two teeth, Tadamus two. Hmm. This, yeah, just kept going. No kidding. That's pretty then cool. You, then you threw some numbers in there. And the next thing you know, you got like a chant, you know, two, five and a half, seven. You know, you just start. Just rolling it. That's you know? awesome. I did that when I learned a turkey call, except I was playing Ben Lee Rogers from Alabama in my cassette tape deck and learning, and with my mouth call, learning how to call a turkey. A cassette tape. Yeah. Do you remember what's, those? What's a That's the next tape? generation of the 8-track. <laughs> I don't know if you, you might be too young to remember no, the 8-track. No, I, 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 hey, actually, we had an old farm truck. It was a 77 Ford pickup. Mm. Slam the 8-track Alabama roll on in there. Oh, I love that song. <laughs> that was the greatest 8-track ever. I think that was one of the first songs I learned every word to when I was a kid. Yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely interesting, you know. We had an old farm truck, and unfortunately, my brother took care of that on on the road. And gotcha. It went it went for a tumble over. And uh, I bet old Fredman Buck would like that kind of truck. Yeah, I bet he would. You know, he's all about the A track player. We need to call Fredman. You know, I I haven't talked to him in a few days and check in on him. I heard that he got his ticket book wet or something. No doubt, probably got some of that rain on him. Well, I think he fell down trying to write a ticket, something. It was, yeah, I don't know. I I lucked out and got him on the CB one night, you know, and I, before I could get it powered down, he realized I was there went by accident. Went I to it. throw on the siren, slipped on a banana peel, rolled down the bank or something. Yeah, there's always a story behind what Fredman's got going on. Man, that guy's a piece of work. He is something. Uh, we've got a great show this week, Dusty, as usual. We've got uh, Tag and Brag. David and Dean Giarizzo from Tag and Brag Outdoors. And uh, we, we bumped into David um, basically talking to him via Facebook. And we realized that he had an awful lot of cross members where his community members were very much like and were also part of the Big Buck Registry community. So I thought it'd be interesting to talk to David about his life story and kind of how they all got started. Yeah, it's crazy that, uh, you know, what they've 
got going there. Yeah. Uh, social technology is what they're striving to create a lifestyle, you know, um, among other outdoors men and women. These guys yeah, are pretty I, intense. I, yeah, it's crazy. But yeah, awesome. They, you know, they, it seemed like they just looking at uh, tag and brag. Looks like they got a lot of things going on for themselves. Yep. So if you'd like to check out uh, the website, it's tag-n-brag.tv. That's their website. And on Facebook, it's facebook.com forward slash brag now. And you'll see everything that's going on. But uh, we get to hear the whole story, kind of how they grew up, uh, where they grew up, how they started videotaping, and how they're, they're basically just turning this whole thing into a, a a career really and and making videos and making cool videos and having fun doing it yeah absolutely you know and that, that's what it's all about as long as you're having fun everything else comes together yep so let's uh let's get dave and dean on the line right now let's do it david and dean welcome to the big buck registries big buck podcast thank you thanks for having us well we're excited we hear you from new york and that uh, you got a really cool thing going on called tag and brag yeah, we're uh, we're actually from Ohio. We grew up hunting uh, up in New York, uh, but originally from Cleveland, Ohio. We spend a lot of time up here. My grandparents have a lake house up here, so kind of nice, a uh, couple hour get away from the house in Cleveland. Right on. All right, so you so you're from Ohio originally. Yep. And whereabouts in Ohio? You Cleveland? Is that's where you that's where you grew up? Yeah, about twenty miles uh, east of Cleveland. Gotcha. So now you're making a living or, or attempting to to go into the outdoor industry. What was it like growing up around that area? It must have been somewhat city-like, wouldn't it be? Yeah, I mean, we're we're just getting on the outskirts of uh, the city. I mean, literally. Um, but yeah, that's why uh, that's why we grew up hunting up here in Western New York. I mean, my grandfather had land up here, and you know, we just there, there's a lot of urban hunting that goes around in our area. You know, we just got we just got into it up here because that's where we found our place to hunt. And um, so yeah, it is uh, as far as. Uh, the neck of the woods it's definitely we're definitely not in that or we uh live in cleveland ohio but um there's certainly places to places to go that's for sure gotcha. yeah it was it was different growing up i mean it was uh like friday nights football games and stuff like that all of our friends were you know hanging out tailgating and stuff for the football games and we were getting picked up by my dad or my uncle you know out of school early on friday to, to rush up to new york and, and get in the woods for the last couple hours so um you know a lot of our friends really didn't grow up hunting and you know it's funny because we've gotten some of them in into it since then just you know them seeing our passion with it and, and being hunters for so many years but it was definitely more of a i guess yeah more of a city city feel but we threw a little outdoor twist on it interesting so your brothers is that correct yeah yep two years apart all right so i have a brother you guys competitive in situations with each other or especially back <laughs> then I understand. Yeah. Well, we used to fight like crazy. I mean, just really bad, brutal, like fisticuff kind of stuff now and then. What, what was life like for you? <laughs> I'd say we got into that a little bit growing up. <laughs> it was a lot more when we were younger, uh, kind of at each other's throats. But, you know, honestly, hunting's kind of bonded us since we've been in high school. And you know, I'm lucky to say that, you know, not to sound sappy or anything, but my brother's one of my best friends, my hunting buddy. And, uh, you know, now it's, uh, it's, we're business partners, and, yeah, everything's all good. I mean, there certainly were some brawls back, back in the day growing up, but we've, we've grown out of that, I think. Yeah. It's, it's hard when you got to spend so much time in them, with them in the tree. you got to, you know, you got to find your peace at least a little bit. Right. What did you guys fight about back then? Ah, uh, you know, we were, we were uh, big into sports, especially baseball. I mean, we spent uh, the summers traveling, playing baseball, and um, among other sports. But we were just, you know, whether it was in the backyard playing, we were just always competitive of who's winning, who's doing this. We would, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, we're only two years apart, so you have a, a younger brother who's trying to prove himself and an older one who doesn't want to let, let, let go of the dominance at all. So. Right, right. Who's older? Uh, I, uh, David's older. David's older. Who's That's the right. better hunter? Yeah. yeah. That is a tough question. It's a trick question. Um, would you say you guys are, are equally skilled at this point? Yeah, I mean, it's. I, I would say definitely, just because. I mean, a lot of our um, a lot of our knowledge and experiences have, have honestly been together. I mean, and you know, whoever someone's hunting, you know, the other one, you know, the other one is, is filming. So we're constantly learning from each other, whether we got the bow in our hand or the camera. Um, so I mean, I, I think. I think we're both very, uh, very knowledgeable this board. I wouldn't necessarily say one gotcha. really better than the other. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, uh, the, the filming aspect of it kind of kind of brings in the whole team atmosphere. You know, it goes from uh, 
kind of a solo sport to a team thing, and you, you need more chemistry in the tree than you think you do, you know, one having the camera and one having the bow. So, like Dean said, I mean, learning from each other, and, you know, the same thing as growing up being competitive. I mean, we both push each other now. Um, you know, we have little friendly competitions shooting our bow. I mean, we're pre- predominantly bow hunters. Um, so whether it's shooting the bow or, you know, getting a certain shot or footage in the woods, you know, we're always coming back to the house watching the footage, like, look what I got, look what I got, and stuff like that. So, it's, yeah. you know, it's a fun competitive nature, but it kind of both dri- it drives us to be better. Right. Right. And that's good. That's good. It makes you better all around people, I think, as long as you don't kill each other along the way. That's that's the whole goal. Right. Now, all right, you got to pronounce your last name for me. Chirizzo. Chirizzo. Got it. We should have made you try it first. No, you should have. But I'm the host, so I, got, I get to pull the strings. <laughs> right. Chirizzo. Gotcha. All right. So hunting became a, a very important part of your youth. Um, when when all your friends were heading over to the football game on Friday nights, you're heading out of town to go hunt for the weekend um was there anybody was your father that was the inspiration behind that yeah i mean it was really uh it was really my father and and my uncle his his brother um they were you know they were dragging us in the woods at a young age um and i don't know we just got kind of hooked on it and they were i think they were hooked on taking us as well so it just kind of you know yeah they they just influenced us i mean Literally, you know, back in the day when we just had the ladder stands, we would go up and we would be sitting in between their legs while they're standing on the platform. Hmm. And, you know, we're, we're battling the weather and, you know, probably annoying the crap out of them, wanting to go get out hot chocolate or whatever. But, no, I really... uh it really kind of worked out just having uh, my uncle involved also because, you know, my dad wasn't, you know, didn't have to occupy us both in, in a tree stand. We could go, you know, one went with one and, you know, the other one with the other. So it was uh, really both of them that really influenced us and got us passionate about sport. Gotcha. Yeah, my, my, uncle's, my uncle's 11 years younger than my dad. So, you know, he's he's almost half the distance between my dad and myself in age. So it was almost like he was an older brother and he didn't have kids yet. Um, so it worked out perfect. You know, he him coming home from, from college at West Virginia or, uh, you know, when he got out of college, like you said, they were always picking us up from elementary school, middle school, and dragging us up here on Friday afternoons. And, you know, I mean, we spent countless hours in the woods, even when sometimes we didn't want to when we were younger. But, it, you know, that that's what shaped the passion and kind of made us who we are today and pursuing a career in the, in the industry. Gotcha. And how old were you when they first took you out in the field? Oh, man, I think I was probably six or seven, and Dean was only four or five. He was young. I mean, he... <laughs> I think I had purple snow pants on the first time. <laughs> <laughs> the old purple snow pants. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know where you, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, so, so your uncle and your father, those are the two guys that are responsible for your inspiration and your motivation today. What was your dad like? You know, he's uh, he's been a huge role model, a huge influence to us growing up. Um, he's he's had his own business ever since he uh, was younger. We actually uh, we have a family business in the auto body industry, and it's gone through three generations now. But he's branched off to you know create his own a whole uh, business of his own, and um, you know so that's kind of what inspired us. But he's just I mean he's always he's always been there. And for us, when we were growing up hunting, you know it was all about our experience. So if a deer walked by that you know maybe he didn't think you know was shootable or something, but we wanted them to shoot it, he was letting an arrow go just to appease us. Um, you know so and that was the cool part about him you know it was always it was always about us and we're you know, super fortunate for that we're super fortunate that you know he took the time to get us into the outdoors and you know to kind of push not push us but shape the passion that we have now uh you know a lot of kids aren't fortunate to have that and you know it's one of the things that dean and i can kind of look back on and and be very thankful for gotcha and what about your uncle you said he was 11 years younger so he was a little closer to age to you at that point what was it? What was he like? What kind of uh, what kind of things did he provide for you that your father didn't? <laughs> the entertainment. <laughs> the entertainment. All right. Good ways and bad. My dad, he'd be asking him to shoot. My uncle, he'd be telling him to stop. <laughs> exactly. He, did, I, he never had enough arrows in his quiver. That was for sure. Um, no, he was. He always honestly, <laughs> like he was. He was really like you know more of like a big brother figure to Dean and I, and you know teaching us all the right things, but at the same time you know teaching us that you can definitely skate the boundaries a little bit too. Right. Uh, 
uh, I don't, you know, not, I'm not certainly not just hunting, but just all things. And um, you know, he's got a, a great personality. He's real outgoing. He, he's not not afraid to laugh, not afraid to make people laugh. And um, you know, I think that's where Dean and I get our, our entertainment factor. At least we think we do uh, from him because you know he's always one to to crack a smile and provide a laugh to the crowd. Gotcha. So, are your would you say your dad and your your uncle are opposites in in many ways? Question. I mean, they kind of compliment each other, I would say. Gotcha. No, but, um, yeah, I mean, you know, my, my dad grew up in the family business. My uncle kind of branched off and, uh, been uh, fishing on a professional bass circuit. He did the FLW for a while down in Texas, and now he's in Tennessee, and he's in the uh, in, a, in Tennessee. Actually, the president of Tennessee Federation Nation with bass. Um, hmm. So you know, he kind of took his own path and kind of created his own um, career off of what he was passionate about. And so that you know that definitely shaped us, us as well because you know it, it kind of provided that that reassurance to go take a chance and you know you can your dreams can come true. I mean, you, you can work it and, and uh, ha- or have your work be your passion at the same time. So, um, yeah, I mean, they're opposite in a lot of ways, but they, like Dean said, they definitely complement each other. Gotcha. So it sounds like you're watching your uncle kind of go through the, the get into the prof- professional outdoors and make a living at it and have some success. Would that kind of drive you home, like saying, all right, you know, if he can do it, then, then I think we can too? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I would say that was a huge, uh, huge influence for us, you know, getting into doing what we're doing. It just, yeah, I mean, and he's always kind of been the one to say, too, you know, just do what you love. And, you know, he, he grew up um, just as we did in the you know, outdoors, especially fishing. And he, he just how he, he absolutely loved it. And he did everything he could to, uh, you know, make himself better and, and put himself in the position to, to be a professional. So, um, yeah, I would say absolutely. I mean, it, you know, growing up, we all, even Dean and I, for a while, worked in the family business. And pretty much my, my dad's side of the family, um, you know, my, my uncle, all worked in the family business. So for him to branch out, um, you know, and say that he was going to go take this chance and, you know, kind of go out on a limb, it was it was eye-opening to all of us in the family, I think. Uh, but for Dean and I, as we got older, you know, getting a passion uh, for not only hunting but then capturing our hunts on film, it was like, well, you know, why can't we do this too? So it definitely... Uh, uh, it definitely motivated us and, and drove us and reassured us that, you know, we could take a chance where, you know, we could be successful as well. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a good uncle to have, kind of pave the way and show you that you can do something like that. So, oh, absolutely. So what was high school like for you guys if you were splitting on Friday nights? Uh, were you popular, not popular? What what was the, the, the recourse there for not showing up and hanging out? Um, you know, it was funny. I mean, you you had a lot of friends that were, um, were Dean, to, I guess, were retract a little bit. Dean and I both grew up playing sports and stuff throughout high school. Um, you know, Dean was a good basketball player, baseball player, played a little bit of football. I mainly played baseball. But um, so growing up, you know, playing sports and whatnot. I mean, we were. I don't know if you would call us popular, but <laughs> um, right. we're in the in crowd, I guess. You guys are athletes. Uh, but, You're the, the the jocks, so to speak. Yeah, and uh, but at the same time, you know, at the you know being at the football games and that type of camaraderie throughout high school that all a lot of kids our age enjoyed. Um, we certainly enjoyed our fair share of it as well. But a good majority of the times, like you said, we were splitting and, and getting back up to the lake to uh, to hunt uh, Friday afternoon. And you know, I mean, those we kind of had our time because the fall, you know, we were gone most of the time. But you know, once the spring came around, you know, we would hang out and I mean, be with our friends and stuff like that, just like any other high school uh, kid would do. But you know, when it when it came down to the fall, especially deer hunting, we were uh, we were in the woods. There really wasn't a close second place for us. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, you can the beauty of baseball is that it's played pretty much during the summer. So right. when that's kind of wrapping up, it's hunting season, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Perfect timing. Perfect timing. So I think if you're playing football, it's going to cramp your style a little bit if you're a hunter. It's got to exactly. Yep. So I can see how baseball and hunting kind of go hand in hand because. Well, they're two great all-American things to do, and they give you something to do all year round. Absolutely. Nice. So when did you just decide that, when did you introduce the camera to everything? Uh, what was it, David? Eight years ago, probably? Yeah, eight years ago. You know, we just, we would watch, we had so many VHS tapes of, you know, Monster Books and, you know, Drury and, you know, all the all the popular guys that have been out at that point. And, you know, we, we loved watching, you know, any show we could. Um 
at the same time, we would always sit there and say, you know, we, we could do this better, we could do this better. Um, and, you know, not for, not to put a knock on anyone else because these videos, you know, everything is awesome. We're just, we're, we always have that drive to, to get better. We just loved watching them so much and we wanted to do it. But, yeah, one, one day we just started taking a, it was a little Sony camcorder, literally. We stuck... Uh, like camel fell, camel fell to it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we would literally go in there and have it around our neck. Yeah, you know, after three or four hours, your neck's drooping and sore, and but well, that's terrible. That's what we did for two or three, two years. Yeah, probably two years before we even got a decent camera. <laughs> All right, um, but so, yeah, it was a, uh, it was, you know, it was honestly, it, it was the experiences that that happened that weren't like a kill or a harvest that, you know, kind of drove us to say, you know, we need to start bringing the camera in the woods. And like Dean said, I mean, we grew up watching Michael Waddell and Bill Jordan and the Drury's and, you know, they were all, we, I mean, we had every DVD you could imagine, VHS, whatever. And, you know, we always, we were infatuated by it. We wanted to, we wanted to be those guys. We wanted to be like them, be able to catch our experiences on film. And, um, you know, so that's kind of what motivated us when we were younger. And we always, we always went back and forth on, we need to bring the camera in the woods. We need to bring the camera and you know for a couple of years we always said we would and we didn't um and then finally one year we just kind of cracked down and said we're going to bring it in and we did we hunted most of the year with it my dad and my uncle and they they kind of thought we were nuts to be honest um they didn't necessarily understand it to a, you know to what we did they didn't understand the passion um especially when we're i mean we we've screwed it up off time too i can guarantee it so you know seeing us down in the sport, I think they thought we were, you know, they thought we were nuts for, you know, keeping the camera in our hands. And it was always like, just get rid of the camera, go shoot something already. And, you know, there was, there was times when we would. Um, and as soon as we wouldn't bring the camera out, somebody would knock something down. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it was just for us, it was, it was a no brainer. We were going to stick with it and, you know, trial and error, we we're going to get better. And at, to this day, we can say that we're, we're self taught and, and proud of that fact that we've kind of brought ourselves up uh, in the filming aspect of things. Cool. All right, so your trial and error, I mean, that's like just a fact of life. you got to figure out what you're doing wrong before you can do it right. Yeah. Let's. You must have learned a bunch of stuff over the years, and one of the things that oh my gosh. we love to hear and learn from other people's mistakes, so to speak, because you've learned what to do and <laughs> what not to do, let's get into some of the things that you've learned along the way that has taken your hunt to the next level. Um, what? Give me a few things that, that you do today that are different than what you did when you first started? Um, well, you know what? I would say one thing is have that camera rolling, you know, a lot more than, you know, just, all right, I'm ready to film you in an interview or whatever it is. There's a deer coming, turn the camera on. I mean, we'll put, and we have a lot of different cameras um, up in the tree with us, and that's, that's another thing that we do different now, you know, six years ago, it was just one camera, you know, now we got three or four up in the tree. Um, but, you know, when we're setting up, when we're climbing out the tree, when we're, you know, talking, calling, whatever we're doing, we just, we have the camera running a lot because, you know, you can always throw footage away that you don't want to use, but at the same time, it's, it's those, you know, second angles or reaction shots or, you know, it, it's those times the camera's running that you normally wouldn't film that we actually end up using a lot of that footage. It, it puts the story together, um, you know, you a lot of people think that the the hunt is all about the kill shot, but it, it really is about putting a, a whole story together. And some of the deer that we've shot or that we're still pursuing, there's years of, of history with these deer, uh, with these animals. And so it being able to put all that together, um, you know, like Dean said, those cam our cameras are running, you know, more off more often times than not when in the woods, if not all the time when we're in the woods, we have some camera, whether it's a GoPro or a, a side angle, D, you know, DSLR or whatever the case may be, we have something running. Um, you know, I, I mean, preparation is a huge thing that I think we've learned over the past couple of years uh, filming, especially bringing more equipment, like Dean said, more cameras in the woods. You can't be prepared enough with charged batteries, with cleared cards. I mean, you know, it, nothing's worse than getting in the woods in the morning on a crisp November morning and you look out and you have, you know, 30 minutes of battery life on the camera. Well, you can't really get a substantial story shot with 30 minutes or you have to be conservative with you know with your battery life then so it just it makes the hunt a lot different um but i'm trying to think what else what about some like um and those are great tips for anybody that's trying to film their own hunts what about some hunting tips like what have you learned along the years that it would improve your hunt so that you can have those opportunities um, trail cameras is a huge thing. Okay. I mean, we, you know, we got out or we got into having trail cameras 
obviously, you know, six to eight years ago, we would have, you know, a select amount of trail cameras out. But now we run at least a handful of cameras all year long. And now we got, we probably have up close to 20 at, between, you know, Ohio, um, New York, and Tennessee, where we hunt a little bit down by my uncle in Tennessee. But, I mean, those have been a huge asset to us because you just learn the behavior. Um, you learn, you know, especially if you have them out all year round, you know, you learn where the deer are moving, um, how they're how they're patterning, the different uh, stages of, of the seasons for the deer and where they're moving and where they're not. Um, and, I mean, those have been a huge asset to us, and it's, I mean, it's been a huge asset to really being able to hunt specific deer throughout the years uh, because, you you know, you have them patterned, you know they're there, um, and, you know, some deer never show up during daylight hours, and you, you, you would never know that that particular deer was there or, uh, or through that area had you not had that trail camera out. And, you know, even though they don't show up, you always know that they're there, so it motivates you to get out and, you know, be in the woods more, especially competitive hunters like us. Um, you know, if, if we got a good buck on camera, we're going to be in the woods every chance we get, a good wind in that area or whatever, um, to be pursuing them. Gotcha, gotcha. So over the years, you must have had some great experiences with some whitetails and some great hunts. What, uh, what, what kind of trail cameras you guys got out? Uh, right now, we're running Covert. Nice. Yeah, we actually just, we actually just partnered up with Covert. Um, finalized everything a couple weeks ago and uh i mean we've used every trail camera in the book uh you know trial and error once again um, and i've learned a lot of different things using trail cameras but for us personally we've we found that coverts for us are the most reliable and uh, i guess by that i mean you go to the camera and check it after two to three weeks you're going to have pictures on that card and the cut and the camera is still going to be running um you know we we yeah and, and, and going off that too it's there's a lot of all those little important things with a camera that people don't like, necessarily realize. You know, it's not just if it runs or not, but, you know, these cohorts are running. We got pictures of deer that are, you know, 60 yards away from the camera in a food plot. You know, we don't have it on food plot mode. It's going off there, you know, it's going off the sensor. So it's getting deer you know, that are not close to the camera. Sometimes these cameras don't go off unless the deer are within, you know, 15 to 20 feet of it, right in the middle of the frame. I mean, as soon as someone walks in the frame of these cameras, they're going off. So it's just giving us a lot of information um, that's really reliable that we need. Yeah, and it, it, we've, we've felt, that once again, going back to trial and error, we felt that, you know, through using all these other trail cameras that, yeah, the, the coverts have, have made us the best that we can be. Yeah, I, I agree with that, you know, and I'm fortunate enough that Colbert just joined up with me, too. I'm, I've actually got a Colbert ball cap on right now. That's awesome. Me, too. <laughs> Man, I feel left out. <laughs> what the heck? Yeah, uh, you yeah. know. What I think what I like most about Colbert Trail Cameras is it, you call down there and talk to Pat Howard. You, you've got some information coming your way about what's going on with your trail camera, why, if you got questions, they've got answers, and that, that means a lot in my eyes. Absolutely, yeah. The support is, is second to none, and I mean they've been nothing but supportive to us as well. So I, I completely agree with you. Gotcha. Yeah, that, that's uh, you know, that's getting harder and harder to come by. Customer service means a lot to a business and to a consumer buying their product. That means a lot, you know. And Culver seems to have it. So I, you know, I, I have to agree with you. I've seen a lot, not too many, too many trail cameras out there that are triggering pictures off a spider crawling up a rock. I don't know if you guys seen that or not. But uh, they had a Colbert that's, picture that's, of us. That's crazy. I actually, I just checked our one camera today, and there was a blank picture. I'm like, that's weird. You know, where's where's the animal? And I clicked to the next picture that was also blank, and there was a bird on this log that had to be 35 yards behind the camera, or in front of the camera, I should say. And I could, the only way that I knew that it was a bird and that it was there is because from one picture to the other, it had moved about five feet down the log. So it must have, like, jumped or flown down the log or something, and right. it caught it, I was like, I cannot believe that that camera just went off of that bird. Yeah, that's crazy, you know. That, that A lot of cameras don't do that. They don't pick up no, the details. Absolutely. Awesome. Interesting. Let's get into some hunts, guys. I want to hear some of your, you know, one or two best hunts you've ever been on, one of your most memorable uh-huh. that you can remember. Um, you're traveling from Ohio to western New York. Is that correct? Western New York area? Yeah, western New York, yep. Okay. I'd like to have Dusty run us through with you guys some two of your most memorable hunts, one for each perhaps. Maybe it's the same one, I'm not sure. But I'd like to hear like the play by play from alarm clock to hanging the deer in the barn. Um and find out what you, what you did to get there along the way, what preps you used, what equipment you were using, and how'd you how did you make that successful? Let's let's get in let's open up a little bit with, with uh 
early spring. We're going to start out your whole season here. I want to kind of break down. You guys, we talked a little bit about food plots before we got started with the actual podcast here in the show. Tell us a little bit about what you guys do. Are you just got food plots in New York or do you have them in Ohio also? Um, no, we have a little bit of both. We have more land up in, here in New York, on, um, so it, it's on a little bit of a bigger scale here. But Ohio, we have a, a lot of smaller tracts of land to hunt. So between my grandpa's place and my dad's place, uh, you know, we make do with what we got. I mean, they're small. Some of our food plots are uh, even an eighth of an acre of clover or something, but just, you know, something different there um, to channel the deer. And, you know, in the areas that we're hunting, it's, it's been effective over the past couple of years. Right. We're, we talk about a hunt here. Where's go, Where is this memorable hunt? coming from let's get in that area well, well i don't know which one you want to talk about <laughs> i would say one of them i mean i, I gotta say oh man that's tough i mean the one from last year's i gotta say probably my yeah my most memorable would be la- my uh, buck i shot last year in ohio probably the best buck so far um so we're in we're in ohio yeah we, we're in ohio. Are we, are so, we hunting we hunting timber we hunting out in a field hunting, a food plot tell we're us about timber it. now we're hunting timber and it's actually this um narrow section of timber i mean it's probably I don't know, 150 yards, maybe 200 yards wide, but there's literally, there's two big bedding areas. Actually, when I say big, it's big for these tracks of land we're hunting, but I mean, maybe seven to eight acre bedding areas on either side, um, I should say on either end of this uh, track of timber. But we were, uh, this was actually a buck that we had gotten pictures of, and David passed up. We had him on camera about three different times the year before. Wait, 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 wait. He made me pass him <laughs> up the year before three times. Now, like, this I is was, what I'm I talking mean, about. Here we go. Yes, I was locked and loaded and ready to roll, and all he kept saying was, this year is going to be a hoss next year. He's going to be a hoss next year. And sure enough, on the first day of the season, it's, it's tough to make Dave pass up on something, especially when it was uh, mid-January. There's about 10 days left in the season. Oh, that's three eight, feet of snow. Eight degrees, and the steer's at 20 yards, and I'm telling him not to shoot. Yeah, and we uh, got the cameras. God forbid we <laughs> shoot something on camera. <laughs> there, there, there may be a little bit of conf- competitive. Side I think, you. yeah, I think it's coming out oh, right now. Trust, yeah, yeah, I, I think it's the still there. Out, trust me, he had my bow zip tied, I think. <laughs> <laughs> After the third time we saw the thing. Because I told him, if we see him a fourth time, I'm one more rep. That's awesome. Yeah, that, that, that's the fun part of being brothers and, and doing what you're doing. There's a lot there that you can be competitive on. And, you know, one brother may overrule the other brother, and it could be a big mistake, but, you know, it was fun why it happened. So you're in Ohio. We're hunting on it like 150 yard tree. We're in some timber. And uh, what kind of stand are you in? We're, uh, we're actually in two muddy hang ons. And uh, we actually, um, you know, the only tree we could find that there was a creek or actually a ravine that was it actually kind of zigzagged back and forth throughout this timber, and um, we actually the deer were just crossing it. There's actually one spot they could only cross it, and we had a trail camera out there, um, probably probably since August or so, late late August maybe, and um, we were getting a picture of this bachelor group of bucks, and this year that they, I made day pass up um, was constantly <laughs> in them, and we would get them. You know, we would get some daylight pictures, but they would be, you know, first light or last light in the morning. And we were getting excited because I was realizing that some of the, you know, these bucks are going to be huntable. If we can get in there early season, try to stand up, you know, we're going to be able to kill one of these deer. Um, but the only tree that really made sense was, uh, you know, it was, just a, it was a narrow tree, so we had to get way up there. I think we had two sets of climbing sticks stacked on top of each other. And I'm not good with heights, so I mean, I, that's another <laughs> I feel you. we disagree on. And I, this kid likes to be a monkey in the tree and get 40 feet off, and I'm, I could <laughs> live off going 10 feet off and be just fine. <laughs> <laughs> does, it, does it make it, do you get nervous going that high? You know, one brother wants to go, the other one don't. When you got to get up Yeah, high. well, I mean, you know, he's got the bow in his hand, so as the cameraman, I really don't have a choice, unfortunately. But, yeah, I get real nervous. I mean, you know, you got that, I, we got a big Badlands backpack on that's like 40 pounds with the tree arm and everything like that. And, <laughs> I mean, getting up there in the dark, in the pitch black, is definitely nerve-wracking. You to hang your stuff up. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> right on. So so we're, we're, we're 82 feet in the air. And, and, a, and a muddy and a muddy hang on <laughs> so wait, wait, tell us a little bit about your camera setup you guys said that you got a tree arm and, and i'm pretty sure that's what i heard is that correct yeah yeah how many cameras are you running in the tree when you're at this particular setup well oh so we uh we have one big uh, sony nx5u which is a you know it's very similar to the ax2000 i don't know if you're familiar with. yeah um, well, yeah we we talk a little bit of cameras on here and repeat what you said there what what are you actually using we're using the 
uh, Sony NX5U. We get all of our cameras from Campbell Cameras. Uh, gotcha. Their their customer service. We we've gotten to know them. We actually uh, we did the Campbell Outdoor Challenge to kind of get off topic a little bit uh, in 2011. That's where we really kind of kicked off our hunting career, I guess. Um, gotcha. But anyway, since then we've we've gotten to be good friends with the guys at Campbell. So. Um, we have uh, we run an NX5U and then we usually have a DSLR. We have this Canon 70D now that we usually keep like in the book bag, and we'll just you know periodically throughout the the hunt, one of us will throw it around our neck, and um, we have the other we have the Sony on a on a tree arm, so that's it just kind of sits off to the side on a tree arm. We got a remote, you know, so you control everything with your thumb. Nice. Uh, and that's what's kind of cool about our setup. I mean, you you know, for the cameraman, you never really have to have your hands on the camera. You control it all by thumb, and it makes it real easy to focus on the deer while they're and frame um, coming in and stuff like that. So, you know, it allows us to have that 70D around our neck, and then we usually have, you know, one to two and even three GoPros at a time, um, some up in the sand, some we have throughout turkey season this year. We actually got into setting them out like a toys and running the little remotes off the uh, GoPro app on our phone to, right. to get some crazy angles that way too. So, right. yeah, anywhere you... from... Go that? ahead. Go ahead. No, yeah, anywhere from you know three to five cameras while I'm running up in the in the stand with us. Right. What 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 uh, what GoPro have you had the best luck out of? Ah, uh, uh, you know, I think we've had every single one of them. Man. Yeah. The most the, the most consistent one is the Hero Two for sure. Yeah. We had a we had a Hero Three, one of the newer ones that was just the battery life was a little bit inconsistent, a little bit frustrating, and it it would start whacking out where it would turn on the Bluetooth would just turn on and it would drain the battery and stuff. So. But the new, the new Hero 3s are, are for sure the yeah, best what, quality. Yeah, I think so. That, that's the tough thing is the Hero 1 and 2, those cameras have just run for us. I mean, they, yeah, they, yeah. they're usually not, um, you know, glitching or freezing or anything like that. Um, they're just running. But, yeah, the, the quality of footage, um, you know, from the 1 to 2 to the 3 is, is a lot, you know, it, it's a big difference, and especially in low-light conditions. Um, so the Hero 3 Plus is what we have now is, that, is you know, as far as quality-wise, it's definitely the best camera awesome so you, you guys are actually putting cameras out by the decoys and trying to get some other angles on your shots and stuff yeah we're, we're you know i mean the, the industry kind of pushes you to that it's it, you know it's about being creative and getting different shot angles now you know like we've talked about i mean it's no longer one to two cameras in the woods just see how many cameras you can get in there and put in your backpack and carry in there and set them up everywhere so yeah i mean we you know we try and be creative and stuff like that and i mean that uh, you know gopro with the app now um you know running off your bluetooth has made it significantly easier because you can literally see what your shot looks like on your phone, set up a shot, and you know, get off into the tree, and you're and you're good to go. Now in the right. dark, you know, it's a little bit. You kind of have to guess a little bit, but um, nonetheless, you can see what you're shooting on your phone from the tree if you have something that's out of reach. Gotcha. Yeah, that's very cool. You know, awesome. So we're in Ohio. We got our Sony in the tree. We got our. We're 82 feet in, in, in the air, and we got our GoPros out. Tell us. Get in a little bit about what you guys wear as far as camouflage. Oh, uh, right now we're. Uh, we're wearing scent blocker suits right now. Um, a little bit old. <laughs> but we're, we're, we just, we're fresh out of college, you know. It's hard. <laughs> suits are expensive. They, right, yeah. That's understandable. No, we're wearing, uh, yeah, we're wearing scent blocker suits. We get real tree camo typically. Um, and yeah, any, I mean, we're usually rubber boots. I have a pair of Under Armors. I don't know. What do you I got a pair of muck boots? I love them. So Under Armour boots and muck boots and real tree scent blocker suits. Yep. Awesome. So uh, are you spraying down before you head in the woods with any kind of scent cover? Yeah, we use, uh, we actually, the past year, we've used uh, Execute from Muddy. Okay. And we, I mean, they have everything from your, sh- you know, your showering toiletries, the deodorant to, uh, you know, laundry detergent, and then we spray down with our execute spray uh, before we go into the woods as well. I mean, we, you know, with deer hunting, you you have to, you got to take every precaution that you can to, to be scent free, and you know that's why we've we've used scent blocker suits all growing up, and um, you know that's a product that we believe in, and so you know on that on top of uh, using execute, clean it, make sure you know we can do our part um, as much as we can to give ourselves the best opportunity, you know, at, in that moment of truth, you know. But when it comes down to it, a deer's nose is a Years knows and it's it's tough to beat. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, you're you're in their in their house trying to hide in their closet to get a shot on them. You know, it's definitely tough. And you know, scent blocker makes good product, and they're uh, you know, it seems like it's working. That's that's the key factor in most whitetail hunts. So we're geared up. We got our scent blocker on, and uh, we're in Ohio. So what time do you guys get up that day? Let's get into the day of the hunt. What time do you guys leave out that morning? 
Uh, I'm trying to think of what's uh yeah when sunrise time sunrise because obviously it changes throughout the year so you're getting up at different times but I think we're I think opening day we're usually up around like four thirty quarter to five yes yeah, I'm usually up about fifteen to twenty minutes before Dean he's uh, he's a sleeper <laughs> I usually gotta shake him about six times before he gets up even though he's got the phone in his hand on opening day and he shouldn't be sleeping anyway uh... I. <laughs> <laughs> it's like him out of the best sleep. So I woke up at probably about 4.45, 4.30. Dean woke up around 5.15. Oh, nice. Uh, after I shook him, shook him a few times. Yeah, and then, you know, the nice thing for us in Ohio is um, we're, or one of our spots, this spot in particular, um, is about five minutes down the road. So, you know, it's kind of nice. Get up, you know, 4.30, 4.45, get a quick shower, a quick bite to eat, and a cup of coffee, and uh, we can be in the stand. Um, I mean, we, get, we like to get in a solid hour before daylight, especially with all of our camera equipment um we like to be set up if we can you know an hour before daylight so um i mean we, we got to be getting in there 5 30 quarter to six for sure by right. that at that time of year right uh, what what day did you shoot this particular buck on um the 29th of september the season up and on the 28th really so second day of season you yeah, left that day of the season. Ask him nice. what happened the first day of the season <laughs> <laughs> let's hear it let's hear what happened on the first day of season <laughs> Well, the first day of the season, probably it had to be a half an hour after sunrise, I had this same buck at about 17 yards, and I shot right underneath him. Hmm. We, uh, I mean, we yeah. had this year, you know, like Dean was alluding to earlier, we had this year, we felt like we had this year pegged. Um, there was three bucks that he, or there was two bucks that he was with, and he was the most consistent one. He would often show up on his own, but, right. you know, he, he, they were still kind of bachelor groups just breaking up. Uh, but we really felt like this crossing, we could kill this deer on opening morning. And sure enough, like Dean said, a half hour after sunrise, I look up and I see a deer coming. I throw up the binoculars and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. This is going to happen right now. I mean, he was literally walking right at us. Wow. And I mean, we were on, the, the tough part about this, the setup was we were literally on the crossing. I mean, five yards from the ravine. It was the only tree that was suitable for getting two people up high enough um, in the stand. And so we were right on the crossing. So this year literally came right at our tree. Um, but yeah, he missed. <laughs> Yeah, that's part of hunting, you know. If they called it killing, it'd be different. But that, you know, I'm I'm just glad you guys man up and say that you missed. You know, that's uh, not not too many well, people you know, will, the, will say. And yeah, we the funny part we we opened the uh, the episode on Tag and Brag TV with you know with his miss. I mean, we're you know we're firm believers in age. Hey, Tell it like it is, you know. Yeah, we're not trying to hide anything. We're not, yeah. Everything is right. We're not perfect, you know. We're we're hunters, like you said. If, it, if they called it killing, the deer would have been dead that day. But you know, it was the craziest thing was the feeling that we had, or that I had at least, because it was as the cameraman, you know. Watching this thing come in, we got the deer on camera. I mean, perfect in frame, beautiful footage. Walking in, we actually have. A, I had a GoPro above me, so you could see me running the camera, Dean with the bow, and then you could see the buck on the ground in the GoPro. I mean, it was it was ridiculous how perfect everything was. And you know, you always look at it. If, it's, if it seems too good to be true, it is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> and, and I mean, when when he released the arrow, you could. I mean, you could blatantly see that. He shot right under him. I, it was just like the season started. We were so hyped up for the season to start, and it ended all in a matter of seconds. It was crazy. It was just right. it was a wild feeling. Did you think that was the last time you was going to see that particular buck for the season? Oh, I, I absolutely, I did. I mean, the only the only thing that gave me a little bit of high hopes, but even though I did feel like the season was over at that point, but the deer ran. That he ran off probably 50 yards from where he came from, and he stopped, and he turned around and just kept looking in our direction. And, I mean, I could tell he, he it spooked him, but he really did, he had no idea what happened. And he ended up he ended up doing like a couple half circles around us trying to figure out what it was, and then he ended up crossing the ravine past us, um, down the ravine a little bit. He was probably at about 45 yards, which David is, you know, yelling at me to shoot another arrow. I'm like, dude, I just missed him at 17. I'm not shooting at 45. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Uh-huh. Yeah, you know, uh, so, your com- your confidence yeah. level is down, you know, you're you're negative on yourself. Yeah. That was definitely I a good it. choice, I guess. So the next day the ne- the next day we're back in the same setup. Is that correct? We are, yeah, we actually we hunted the same set that night and because, you know, we had the other there's two other bucks, one one other shooter buck, the other one we were we were kinda on the fence on, but you know, there was a couple other bucks in there that 
could have easily, you know, could easily still be in there, um, you know, that we were confident about. So we went in there that night, and uh, we didn't I, we didn't see anything that, that same night that we know. Uh, but yeah, we went right back there the next morning. Yeah, so the next morning, same setup, every everything is the same. You know, I'm I'm sitting there kind of pissed off, like, why are we here? This isn't gonna happen again. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so it was actually about the same exact time. Um, this uh, the one buck we were on the fence of. We call him the unicorn buck because this one side is just kind of kind of goes up. It's just kind of a jacked up rack. But right. he, he came down the same trail that this buck had come from yesterday, and the and the buck we were hunting was by himself. So you know, I'm I'm thinking this year's by himself too. So I kind of. I just picked my bow up, and, you know, Dave's, Dave's filming him, and the way he comes from, Dave's got to, he can film him for a second, and then he's got to spin all the way around the tree with his back, you know, and then film the deer walking past, you know, as he go, as he crosses the ravine and goes past. So he had spun around the tree because the deer was crossing the creek, and I wasn't going to shoot. Right. And I, I heard a stick break, you know, 40 to 50 yards back from where the same buck had just come from. So I kind of turned around, and... You know, out of the out of the canopy of the trees, I see this this ten point again that I missed yesterday, and he's walking. He's not walking right down a tree, but I can tell where he's walking. He's in a cross at about thirty yards, uh, or thirty yards from us. So I'm I'm sitting there and I'm looking over my shoulder, and I David is still filming this other deer across the ravine, and I'm trying to get his attention, but it is so quiet. I, I you know I can't make too much noise, but I'm whispering. I'm going, Dave, hey, Dave. Hey. You know, I'm trying to tap him, right. and he's like. That's one tough thing about filming is this, you know, it's communicating with your, your right. cameraman and your hunter. Um, well, I was I, at the cameraman. I was I was significantly higher than you were in the yeah. So it was just yeah, and that was a big tree. It was off. I mean, I had no idea. I had no idea that the deer was there until I until the other buck had walked off enough, and I kind of peeked around the tree to see what he was doing. And he had his release on his string, and I could just tell, you know, by his demeanor. There's something else there. There's not, he's not, you know, there's there's no reason for him to be facing the way that he's facing with his release on his string because the other deer was, was more or less gone. But I, right. I finally got I finally got Dave to realize, you know, I think I whispered up to him, you know, this you know, this ten points right here and he's uh he's kinda I can tell he's he's trying to figure out where the deer is. He's asking me where and I can't answer, but at this point the deer had about 12 yards before he's going to cross the creek, and he's in an opening about 25 yards away. Literally, broad opening, and I can tell David is nowhere near him with the camera. So I'm just sitting there waiting to draw. I'm thinking I can shoot right now, but I'm like, David has no idea the deer is even here yet. Yeah, for me, it was he was directly behind the tree. I couldn't see him at all, and I was trying to, like, peek a little bit on either side of the tree. I didn't want to get too crazy, and so I just, I just stayed still and waited for Dean to give me some sort of sign that, you know, he was moving but uh finally he made his first couple of steps and he must have been yeah he was behind the tree for david so when he started making his first couple of steps i could tell david finally picked him up and said you know he whispered i got him i got him and there's a big embankment that goes down into this creek and it's it pretty i mean the creek's probably 15 yards wide yeah, at that point it's pretty wide so um he started crossing it i uh i had one one split tree that i could get a i could get a shot if he crossed right at this point and you know i drew I kept yelling, yelling at, you know, whisper yelling at David. I'm like, are you on him? Are you on him? And he gave me a yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was about 28, 28 yards. I, uh, I let him have it at that time and I didn't miss, didn't miss that one. No, uh, we watched him. <laughs> that's that's a good him, thing. He doubled back across the ravine and ran about 40 yards. And I mean, I had to spin the camera back around the tree so I didn't actually get him falling, but we did see him fall. <laughs> right on. Yeah. That's awesome. You know, nice. at, least, at least the buck fever got away, right? Oh man! At that point, you know it was. I mean, talk about a roller coaster of emotions in 24 hours. I mean, right? Yeah, absolutely. We were, you're, we you're were low. going from on, you know, yeah, on cloud nine to the season starting to lowest of lows, and all of a sudden, you know, I mean, Dean just shot his best buck ever. It was, it was insane. Yeah, that's crazy. Your your lowest of lows to your highest of highs all in 24 hours. You know. Yeah, yeah. It was, I bet, it was, I bet it that was, was pretty cool. All the kids got a golden horseshoe somewhere. I don't know, but. Right, yeah, absolutely. You know, that's uh that's a great story. That's uh that's really cool that you got a second opportunity at that particular buck. Most time that don't happen for the average hunter, you know. No, it, no. it worked out for you. Nice. Very nice. Let's talk about tag and brag. So you're obviously talented deer hunters, you've been hunting since you were children. When did you decide that tag and brag should be the next level? Um, it was actually when we were going to college at Ohio State. Um, we had been filming for a couple of years 
just you know kind of messing around with the camera and stuff like that and you know realizing that we want to we want to make our passion a, a career um so tag and brag kind of stemmed from a bunch of different ideas one of us you know uh, us wanting to make our own name in the industry you know with our filming and hunting abilities and you know also wanting to wanting other people to be able to do that as well um so you know we thought of why not give people that opportunity on one on a social network that can connect hunters and fishermen worldwide and we can all share amongst our you know amongst our community and amongst people with the same passions um and and obsessions that we had you know we can share what we've done whether it be through pictures or videos and you know our motto is kind of the trophies in the eye of the beholder we're a firm believer in that i mean we you know we uh are both specific on the deer that we shoot now but um we've shot our fair share of small bucks and stuff like that and are more than happy to show them off you know to other hunters and fishermen too because everybody every one of them story um so that's really you know where it stems is, is when we were at ohio state uh we, we were fortunate enough to live together for a couple of years at ohio state with six of our buddies and you know at nights when we were all hanging out and tossing ideas around and all of a sudden you know ideas became more concrete in a notebook and all of a sudden the notebook spilled up and you know we kind of approached our dad and my uncle about it and thought it was a good idea as well and kind of gave us some uh, advice on how to get started or at least the beginning pieces that we need to, to kind of get it going and so you know that's where we started pursuing it I think I was a sophomore no I had to be a junior in college you know um, and you were a freshman at, at Ohio State so gotcha um, how did the name come about yeah, that's kind of funny. I don't know. We were just, uh, once again, a notebook yeah, idea. A notebook we ideas. ideas. Actually, we originally had Tag It and Brag It, I think. Yeah. Tag It and Brag It, yeah. Tag It, tag it and Brag It, because we wanted to capture, you know, the obviously, like, the, the work that goes into it, and then, you know, with the brand, I guess, we wanted to capture what you're actually doing and then actually, you know, bragging about it in a sense or just as like the word that we use. I right. Guess, yeah, it flows together. It kind of flows together, but at the same time, you know, some people look at the, the bragging word as a, a negative thing. It's kind of not representative of that in our, at least in our eyes, you know, it's, it's, it's sharing it with everyone, you know. Everyone's got an awesome memory and they have a lot of fun out in the outdoors and, and when you're out there and you have success, you want to share it with people. So you're proud of it. So that's, that's really what's about. Gotcha. So you dropped the it, basically. Went to tag and bragging. Yeah, yeah. For a, for a while, it was tag it and brag it, I think. And then Dean was, Dean actually was the one to say, you know, I think let's just drop the it. And it, it was like tag and brag. And at first to us, it was kind of weird because it was like, are people going to really know what this is? You know, are they going to understand? And um, I'm glad we did because it, it, it made the brand, it made it more of a brand and not like a saying. Um, and so, yeah, we dropped it. We dropped the yeah. it and here we are. Well, Facebook did the same thing. They dropped the the instead right. of the exactly. Facebook. It was Facebook. I'm with you. I'm with you on that. <laughs> so where do you want to go from here? Oh, one other question. Are you, are you doing this full time now? Is this how you earn your living? Yeah, we, uh, we're, Dean and I are putting full-time effort into it. We, we have, you know, we do some side work between, you know, painting and, you know, just different miscellaneous stuff on the side, um, to earn some extra cash just because we're, you know, we're, we like to stay active and, um, stay, you know, stay busy with our time, especially right now. There's a little bit more of our downtime. We can kind of take on some of that extra work, but, um, but yeah, we're, uh, we're doing this full-time. We're, we're dedicated to it and, and believe in, you know, kind of our business model and, and what we're trying to sell to people in the industry, but our customers who are going to be the average Joe hunter and fisherman, um, you know, we believe in what we what we want to provide for them. So yeah, we're we're putting full time effort into it, and it's scary and exciting all at the same time. But um, you know, it's a roller coaster of emotions once again, and not certainly not easy, but um, you know, something that we're we're fully on board with. Gotcha. But we, all, we also have tag and we also have tag and brag productions, which you know, not we don't not only film you know all of our hunts, but we become really good at editing them and producing them as well which we all self-taught us. So there's actually some businesses and companies now that are asking us to use our, you know, um, videography and, and film skills, um, you know, to do, sh- whether it's a short film for them, uh, you know, a demonstration video or a product, you know, review or um, product advertisement. So we're actually, we're, we're starting to get into that as well. Gotcha. That's cool because that's some skill sets that you've developed along the way and you can probably help out other people that want to get some of the videography down. That's awesome. Right. Yeah. All right. So basically... From where you go from here is where? Well, you know, what, 
I guess what our kind of vision is is that we can create a you know a network of people, um, like I said, like-minded people, a massive audience, and we want to use um, you know the social network side of things that is for the consumer, you know, for like I said, for the average Joe hunter and fisherman to be able to go on there and and make their own, you know, post pictures, post videos. They're going to have a chance to make their own profile page with their own background and um, you know their own cover photos and stuff like that, so they can really personalize it, and it it, it, om- it almost can be like their little own hunting and fishing domain, Um, you know, not only to post pictures to share with their buddies, but also to archive, you know, pictures from the past. And, you know, we, we see, we see ourselves as limitless. I mean, we see this thing, obviously we want to be able to touch, you know, all of America. We want to be able to reach out to the United States, uh, you know, all 50 states as far as hunting and fishing goes, but we really can see this thing going worldwide, especially with technology these days. And one of the biggest things that we're developing right now is a phone app that goes along with it. That's completely synced uh, with it, you know, similar to a Facebook phone app or Twitter or Instagram phone app. Um, um, but so that people can be sharing, uh, you know, when they're on the water, when they're in the woods, and, you know, be sharing the pictures right, you know, right as they happen and be able to capture those emotions and those memories. Um, you know, we uh, we want to build we want to build a network of people that could be worldwide someday. Gotcha. I think that's a great aspiration, and I think you're on the right track. You know, you're, you're, the content that you're producing is high quality, and the fact that you're you're distributing it on social media – that's where the world lives these days, right? Absolutely. That's excellent. Um, well, guys, this has been fantastic. And I want to thank you for joining us on the Big Buck Podcast and sharing your story and sharing some deer hunting tips. If you had one tip to leave the audience with, what would it be to make you a better deer hunter? Um, the one tip I have is, especially if you're using trail cameras, which is a lot, a lot of people are doing now, is... You know, some people get in, they get they get a lot of cameras running, and they want to hunt the biggest deer at them, and, and, and we all do. But um, sometimes those deer aren't, I like to call them not huntable, because we got, you know, we have three to four bucks that we've gotten pictures of over the last couple of years that literally have popped up on our cameras, you know, it could be dozens of times or a dozen times, but you know they're all at one thirty to three thirty in the morning. Like you can you can spend a lot of time hunting that deer, but the chances are you know he's just not huntable. So if you're getting the daylight pictures of you know a deer you're willing to shoot or wanting to shoot, yep. you got to hunt your huntable deer. I guess I like to say yeah, that's definitely been a thing we've learned over the last really two years. That's that's given us some success. Yeah, and I mean with that you know being a huntable deer that that could change throughout the year. You know like Dean had a great opportunity last uh you know last early fall to take that deer second day of the season i mean that's why we use the trail cameras so much you know before the season but also a ton during the season because you know you can be checking those every couple days and all of a sudden one of your bucks that you're after shows up in daylight that may not be the case for you know so much longer you know he may be in he may be turn nocturnal um you know after he breeds a couple does or whatever the case may be so really using them to your advantage and like d said hunt the bucks that are huntable and those may not be the same bucks throughout the year you know you may have one buck that's huntable in the in the early season that you never see again we've had that we've had that happen plenty of times and all of a sudden another buck you've never seen before shows up during the middle of the rut and all of a sudden is you know on the trail cameras you've seen maybe seen him a couple times during daylight um so you know really like like dean said you can you can exhaust your energy on hunting the biggest buck on your property or you can consistently kill deer by hunting the bucks that are huntable gotcha that's awesome. In a, per, in a perfect life, the uh, biggest deer on your property is home. <laughs> exactly. Right. Right. That's no, always that's... the best scenario, but it doesn't happen all the time. Great, great tip. Dusty, what what other final questions do you have for these guys? You know, you get into a great tip there, and uh, what's one uh, great tip for hunting deer? What's one video and tip that you can throw out there? Oh, man, let's see. Um, Make sure that red button fans. <laughs> ah, good one. Uh, <laughs> yes. No, um. I mean, honestly, um, I, I would personally say, um, and this is, I've, I went, you know, we both went through this starting out. When you're starting out filming, you have to realize that you are not the hunter. And the hunter and the filmer do completely different things. And I've learned this by, you know, showing some people to hunt. But it's very natural and easy when you're filming for the first few times to want to focus you know, on the deer, not on the frame. Observe. You want to observe what the deer is doing because that's what you do as a hunter. But right. you really have to knock 
get that buck fever and, and, and watch that deer through the frame the whole time. And it kind of, sometimes it surprises you because I'll sit there and almost, you know, get in the dream. I'm just locking that deer on the frame and I look up and realize he's 30 yards away. I'm like, holy crap, this deer's right here. But that's what you got to do to get good film, you know, because if you're constantly watching the deer outside the frame and then you look out and, oh, boom, he's off the frame, you're moving it. That's, that's usually when you get the, you know, your quality of footage goes down. So it's not easy to do, though. It's not easy to do. But it's, you know, he, he brings that. That is probably the best tip that I could give. The hunter and the filmer are two different, two different things um and the filmer in order to get quality footage i mean even you know you could see deer 100 yards away a couple hundred yards away through the timber or whatever and you know you could just think it's a flat you know a couple flashes of deer or whatnot well it's important for the cameraman to realize like what if it's a buck chasing a doe what if it's a deer he's never seen before you know you, you just don't know so you always i mean you always have the camera running and um, you know, as a cameraman, you always want to be focusing on the deer in the frame rather than, you know, trying to observe the deer and where they're at. Obviously, you need to pick them up in the frame first. Uh, but once you have them there, you want to follow them in the frame. Uh, you know, it, it just makes for better footage that way. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's a great tip. Very cool. That's that's awesome. Great stuff. Um, any, uh, how would our audience reach out to you uh, offline or online if they wanted to see more content, if they wanted to ask questions? where do we go? Yeah, so right now, um, the best way to get in contact with us is obviously uh, probably through our Facebook page. It's just tag and apostrophe brag um, on Facebook. And then also, to watch our videos, it's tag dash n dash brag dot TV. Tag dash n dash brag dot TV. It's got all of our hunts from the past year. It's got a couple cool hunts from last year. Um, we just finished up our turkey series a couple of weeks ago. Um, so we're rerunning that right now, and we're actually doing a photo of the day, just kind of capturing something that Dean or I are doing throughout the day. Um, that we've gotten some great response from. So between Facebook, Tag and Brag TV, um, Instagram, and, and Twitter as well. Yeah. Uh, we, we're usually, uh, a lot of people are using Instagram now too, and we, we post pictures daily, and we get questions about, you know, what we're doing or about the picture, and we're usually really good about, you know, responding right on there too, so that's definitely another great place to on, contact us. On, uh, on Instagram, it's Team Tag and Brag, all one word. Um, so you can search Team Tag and Brag on Instagram, get in touch with us, tell, you you heard, tell us on any one of those avenues that you heard us on uh you know big buck podcast and we'll uh we'll throw, we'll throw you a t-shirt or something all right that's what i'm talking about awesome. very nice um all right guys i think this is that's a that's a show man we've learned a lot and thank you for sharing all your tips and secrets and your life story and your competitive nature and glad you guys still uh rib each other now and then and off the off the stand and in the stand sounds like you, you still get along enough and uh, you're doing some cool things so very cool, and thanks for joining us. Yeah, we really appreciate you having us on the show. Thanks yeah, for the opportunity. Thanks, thanks so much. You got it. Okay, that was good. All right, thanks again, guys. Well, thank you to David and Dean Giarizzo once again for joining us on the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Learned a lot about kind of you know how you start from the ground, and it seems like everybody that's doing an outdoor TV show has some kind of connection back to the woods as children. Notice that, Dusty? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I, I think that – Everybody that listens can somewhat relate back to their childhood on all of this. Yeah. And, you know, not, I'm going to say 90%. Right. There's there's 10% that just may be getting started in the hunting and, and you're a little bit older and that's okay. You know, you can start, start hunting at any age. That's, that's the cool thing about hunting. Start at any age you should. And I think you should kind of experiment with videotaping your own hunts just to play it back. I've, I actually started converting some of my, my old, uh, Sony Handycam, um, mini DV tapes, the digital, the original digital ones over to DVD. And I found some of my old hunts that I used to, I didn't even realize how many hunts I had videotaped of my own. Really? And I found a bunch, um, lots of turkey hunts, a few deer hunts, but mostly turkey stuff. Right, you know, and that's uh, something that you'll have forever. Yeah, so now I've converted it to DVD, and now I can zip it over to any format I want, HD, online streaming, whatever, um, and play it on my big screen. Now I can really see what it looked like in HD, and I, just watching some of the footage brought me right back to the moment. Like, oh, I remember that turkey. He he hung out for a long time right behind me, and that hen wouldn't leave me alone. She was there for like an hour, and that turkey wouldn't come off the stone wall, and I couldn't turn my head because he was looking right at me the whole time. You know, all these things start rushing through your head of that exact moment and that exact hunt. Yeah, you know, I I can see a person three or four days in a row and still not know their name, you know, right. or remember. But I I can look on the wall 
in my podcast studio, in my living room, out in my garage, I can look on the wall and every deer, anything that I've got on the wall that's obtained outdoors, yep. I can remember every move that my bucks made. Every move. Yes. It's so crazy. Yep. yep. Very cool. Big shout out to our friends down at Premier Outfitters, Mark Clifford and Hal. And uh, they're starting to put together a little run. And I just want to give them a shout out and help them uh, get some things going down there. They're down in Kentucky, 17,000 acres. We've talked to them on the Big Buck Registry before, right after the Great American Outdoor Show or par part of our show. And they've come back. And I didn't realize how many people that are famous that, uh, that hunt there and how or what high quality the hunts are down there. You know, that, it's phenomenal. Yeah. And I've, I've talked to Mark, you know, and Mark's a great dude. He knows what he's doing, and, he, and he's got employees that work for him that know what they're doing. And, and it, it's the next, it, it's a five-star outfitter. Hands you, down. You're not, yeah, you're, you're not going down there for a mediocre hunt. You're going down there, you're, you're going to get the best hunt that's possibly available for you for your time. Yep. You know who deemed them? Uh, this is what Deer and Deer Hunting Magazine deemed that camp. They deemed it Dream Camp. Really? Yeah, seriously. That's awesome. I, I, you know, I so believe it. Just, just talking with Mark. You know, Mark's the owner. Yeah. Talking with Mark, he, he's there's no room for error with what he's doing, right. and that that means a lot for me. Yep. Jason Aldean has hunted down there. You know, I think Willie Robertson's been there. Willie Robertson. A lot of the Buck Commander group ha, have hunted there. Um, I hear Adam Vinatieri, the kicker for the Indianapolis Colts, hunts down there. I guess they're good buddies. So if you want to go on one of the world's most premier whitetail outfitter hunts, free range, then you should probably hook up with Mark Clifford down at Premier Outfitters. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's going to be a, a, an experience of a lifetime. Someday we'll make it down there. I'd like to go down and do a show from the camp because to me, that's not really a camp. It's like a luxury away from home. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's uh, I, I'd be more to go there and check the place out yes. versus the hunting. I, I, I want to get a story behind Premier Outfitters. Yeah. You know, we, we've met Mark. Yes. We met Hal, which is one of his awesome guys that he's got in-house there. You know, them two guys have made me want to go down there as, as media, as what we do, and get the story behind Premier Outfitters and have the experience of the hunters coming in and tell us what they, how their hunt was and what they're seeing and what the deer's like, what the terrain's like. I just want to check it all out and we'll get a better story for you. Yeah. Just, yeah, I'd like to capture the moment just after the hunt, how they felt about everything. Cause you're going to get, that's the time you're going to be the most jazzed up. You know, we try to recreate the stories here on the, the podcast, but getting that story right after the hunt, that's what, I mean, people are just the emotions, the adrenaline. That's when it's all going to really hit home. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and it, that, that'd be a great story and for everybody to listen to how their experience was at premier outfitters you know that, that, yeah they, they can look it up on the internet and they, they can see pictures and they can check it out and they can call and talk to people but actually having somebody tell you how their experience was that's a whole nother level yes very much so um but yeah but i'd like to, I, I, I wish those guys the best of luck this coming fall but i'm i, I want to get down there because i just want to see the deer to be honest i mean be, you're not as prone to that because you have big deer where you are with big racks we have big deer just not big racks Right, you know, it'd be something very unique for you just to go out and be able to glass some deer through binoculars yeah. or, or put a visual on 160 to 180 class deer, maybe 200 inch deer. There's all kinds of bucks down there. Yeah, just get bring my videotape just to watch it. Like, wow, it's crazy. So that's uh, that's something cool, man. What else, what else is going on at Chubby Times? Do you have any uh, tips of the week? You know, I, I do have a tip, you know, and this is something that we're going to keep trying to make a tradition on, uh, you know, setting up things and, and anything you can do with whitetail hunting. Yes. I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to have one of my tips that I use that, you know, that's made me become a better hunter. The Chubby Tines tip of the week. Chubby Tines tip of the week. My tip of the week is that you don't go into an area that you're going to hang a tree stand up and cut down too much because you're worried about your shooting lanes. Over, uh, beautifying the area sometimes will send the mature bucks in a, in a different direction. They know you've been there. So if, if, you, if you're going into an area that's new and you want to cut a bunch of limbs and cut a bunch of shrubbery because you're worried about a shot's going to be here, you, know, you, you can't have the perfect shot, but you can wait on the perfect shot. So don't go in in your, in your area and disturb it too much that a mature buck's going to recognize that, hey, this don't look right. Gotcha. Be, be careful grooming your tree stand setups. Don't over groom is what you're saying. Yeah, that's correct. You know, it's, it's a, I, I take people out numerous times throughout the early fall here and help them set up tree stands and help them get an area 
and help them pick out a good location for a mature puck that, you know, that I've had past experience with that would be crossing an area or walking down a fence row. But, you know, the biggest problem I see, I've been called out to many, many tree stand setups. Hey, you know, the mature bucks were coming in. What have I done wrong? Well, they've went in there and they've cut down way, way too much. They've literally like, you know, clear span the whole area. And, and that's something that's uh, going a red flag, a mature buck. If he comes in an area, then you've got it all groomed down and it's close to season. You know, you may get by with that from one year to another, let it settle for a year, but you can't go in and set a tree stand up and over groom an area. It's going to be a fail right off the bat. Gotcha. Very good tip of the week. Chubby Times tip of the week. Next week, Dusty, we may have uh, what could potentially be the pinnacle of the interview track record here on the big buck registry yeah that's hard to believe everyone we've done has been awesome yeah every time i turn around i feel like we've reached a new plateau uh next week we get to speak with jackie bushman from buck masters that's going to be awesome just intense intense to, to have somebody that's been in the industry this long i mean he's up there with ted nugent and those guys that really formed the industry and then are still going strong you know, it's going to be an honor to have Jackie on it. We really look forward to pulling some information about Buckmasters and about what they've got going on over yep. there. I know we have a lot of Buckmasters fans that are following the Big Buck Registry, and now you get to hear the whole story behind Jackie Bushman. I bet it's a story you haven't heard before. So that's going to be cool. So uh, how can we reach you over at Chubby Tines, Dusty? Facebook.com forward slash Chubby Tines Outdoors. Jay, how can the people reach out to you at the Big Buck Registry? Well, we can go to BigBuckRegistry.com, and uh, the most popular place that we are going right now is for photo submissions. Go to BigBuckRegistry.com forward slash MyBuck, and just follow the instructions. And just a hint, we're looking for pictures of you and your buck, the state of harvest, and the hunter's first name. If it doesn't have all those components, you drastically reduce your chances of getting onto the Big Buck Registry's Wall of Fame. Just just a heads up. Uh, you can reach us at 724-613-2825. That's our feedback line. If you'd like to reach out to us for any reason, uh, you can reach us there. And uh, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Big Buck Registry or twitter.com forward slash Big Buck Registry. I think that's a wrap, Dusty. Awesome. You know look forward to every show we do and we really really thank you for tuning in yes and thank you to david and dean giarizzo from tag and brag outdoors best luck to those guys and uh hope they have a great fall so i'm jay scott and i'm dusty phillips and this is the big buck registry's big buck podcast see you next week can't wait